It is Friday, March 22nd. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone, to another peachy episode of LTPS. As always, let's begin with our PlayStation Plus reminder. The March PS Plus Essential Games still live on PSN. Make sure you claim those before they go away. Also, PS Plus Extra and Premium, the March lineup is now live on PSN as well, which we do know Jack does have a platinum, so... Maybe I'll finally jump into that, uh, but more importantly, we have until April 16th for these games that are going to be leaving the PlayStation Plus game catalog, which will most notably be probably Ghostbusters, the video game remastered, uh, also Soul Calibur 6, R-Type Final 2, uh, Everspace, Dangerous Golf. If you are a fishing game fan, then you've got about three and a half weeks left to play uh, Bassmaster Fishing 2022 and also Real Fishing Road Trip Adventure. So again, these titles will be leaving the PlayStation Plus game catalog on April 16th, so get your time in on these games. Now, moving on to our first news story, as a lot of you probably saw from yesterday, Sony made an update to the Explore icon on PS5, where it's in beta, so right now only a few people probably have access to this. Uh, one of the very few times where I actually got access to it uh, right away, which normally, and I, as you all know, I don't have any sort of correspondence with Sony, so it's not like I was informed about this or anything. I was just lucky enough to get it. Um, but essentially, this is something where uh, on the Explore icon on PS5, you know, historically, it's only been in the U.S., and it's been a page that shows you your followed games, uh, which is basically game news. So you'd have a bunch of tiles for followed games. Uh, then eventually in 2022, it was updated for uh, three little widgets on the right side, which made it a little bit more useful. But now uh, a new beta has rolled out to select users where there's more widgets, a uh, little bit of customization with being able to change the background picture on just the Explore icon, which is the big caveat because I was one of the first people to get this news out there, which means other people were citing my video. Um, so depending on how you saw this some places did not make this obvious that it's not true custom backgrounds as in it does not plot it doesn't apply to the rest of the console essentially so uh, just the explore icon you can change the background image to either select ones from sony or also uh, screenshots you can't you can't use like a usb drive and try to upload a custom image um, and again it's only for the explore icon but either way the usability of the explore page is now like vastly improved. It's way better. There's actually friend activities on there now. So um, it looks a little bit more social, kind of like the what's new section on PS4, which was really the one thing that I felt was lacking on PS5 is that it feels more isolated instead of um, more social like PS4 was. Um, but either way, uh, yeah, it's a great update. I would hope that this does roll out to not only more people eventually, but uh, making this global because the explore icon is only in uh, just the United States. Uh, and it's something where I, I think you didn't need the Explore icon prior, like nothing nothing of value was lost there. But if it looks like this, now I hope that it does finally uh, roll out to more countries as well. So uh, we'll keep you posted on what's going on there. It's not a firmware update, by the way. That was another thing I, I guess I did not make clear, but it's simply a server-side update. You either get access to it on the, on the console or you don't. It's not an email. It's not um, a new firmware. It's simply server-side, hey, here's the beta. So that's where we stand on the new update for PS5. Next up, Rise of the Ronin is finally available on PS5, the new Koei Tecmo and Team Ninja PS5 exclusive, and as we discussed last week on LTPS, based on previews, it sounded like the game was going to score fairly well, but there were some issues that maybe were going to point it in the direction of, you know, reviewing in the high 70s to low 80s, that was my guess at least, and it seems like that's where it fell because uh, yesterday when the previews went live, it does, uh, it's sitting around there, right? So uh, Metacritic, it's at like a 76 across 100 reviews, and then it's a 76 as well on OpenCritic across 54 reviews at the time of filming. So not bad. I mean, that's generally favorable, uh, but it does seem like uh, based on those early hours of the previews and now showing up in the final reviews, it's a matter of like the story oftentimes being considered uninteresting and the open world can be very formulaic as in the game's not necessarily doing anything uh, wildly different or new, uh, but in terms of like prior Team Ninja games, it's still good, enjoyable, gameplay seems uh, really uh, refined as well, so there is something there to play and enjoy. Really, the only problem is that <laughs> two things, which would be, you know, nowadays as we often see with modern Modern review scores if a game is not 85 plus really 90 plus there's this general consensus that the game is like awful that's not the case here uh, but there's also the fact that if this game was launching by itself probably would be in a much better spot but 
But when you've got Dragon's Dogma 2 coming out on the same day, and that reviewed uh, much better at 87 on Metacritic across 58 reviews, and that's only on PS5. On PC, it's better if you do have a you know a PC rig that can run the game a little bit more reliably. Then I mean that's probably the game you're going to want to <laughs> spend your money on and, and spend your time with. Uh, so in that sense, this might not be the best look for Rise of the Ronin in terms of market conditions, but um, I'm still interested in picking it up and uh, trying to get some time in on the game today. Moving on to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, where a new patch is now live on PSN, and this one uh, not only addresses a number of bugs and issues with, you know, things popping up in text with typos or certain emissions, just, you know, things where they're trying to clean up the game now that they're in the post-launch era, uh, but also there is a new update for trying to address the issues with the image quality uh, of the game overall, so there's now uh, sharp and soft filters for the game and options, which seems to help depending on, I guess, how you view it. I don't know. It seems like more of a band-aid fix. I think where this game sits right now in terms of the not even terrible, but general blurriness with the performance mode, that's kind of where it's going to stay until we would hope down the road it does get uh, proper PlayStation 5 Pro support. Now that is a great segue into our next news story, which is about PS5 Pro. We've got more news and rumors and discussions going on here. So uh, first is PSSR, PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution, uh, or also being called pisser by some in the community, which sure, I suppose that works. Uh, but one angle of this, uh, based on a report from Tom Henderson writing for InsiderGaming.com, uh, where they uh, received some internal documentation that shows SIE's ambitions with PSSR, and that's that for future console generations, they want to achieve 4K 120 frames per second and 8K 60 frames per second. Now, the upcoming PS5 Pro is aiming for 4K 60 and 8K 30, but beyond that, they do expect iterations of the in-house technology to reach those heights. Uh, Insider Gaming also published a case study of two unnamed first-party games where PSSR is being utilized and tested right now. So example one for uh, a base PS5 mode for one game is that performance mode is at 1080p 60fps and then fidelity mode at 1800p 30fps uh, but the PS5 Pro setting for this game right now is 1440p at 60fps which bear in mind that means PSSR would probably take that 1440p up to a near 4k image quality. Uh, the other game, the target is to add ray tracing to it, so the standard model could do 60 FPS without ray tracing, whereas PS5 Pro did it with ray tracing enabled. So. This goes into more about what Sony wants to do long term. This is not something where they're planning on doing 8K 60 or 4K 120 uh, for PS5 Pro. But I mean, this is what we were discussing before where, I mean, it's, it's really a smart play for Sony to work on this stuff in-house, come up with their own proprietary solution for machine learning AI enhancements for resolution. Uh, and that's primarily what this is. So it's not quite like AMD FSR, which uh, so far we've seen between FSR and DLSS. DLSS is a lot better. So if Sony has a, a really good solution here, that is again proprietary in-house. All the first party studios can use it. Also, they have an interest here for their PC releases with Nixus being able to adapt to, uh, adapt this for the PC ports as well. It's just a really good, smart, long-term play for the company. So foundationally, you know, PS5 Pro is kind of where this is beginning and they can you know, expand upon it from there and keep developing it further. And um, at a certain point, it's like doing any sort of native high resolution, that being 4K or 8K, just really doesn't make any sort of sense when we can have uh, this technology come in and uh, see some efficiency gains and be able to allocate those resources to other parts of the game for game studios. So um, it's ambitious, and I totally believe it. That is very much, I think, what PS5 Pro uh, is. Th that's what this console, I guess, is, is meant to be right now. You know, Even if you don't want it, it's still foundational something that Sony is going to build upon for PlayStation 6 and beyond. Now, in other PS5 Pro news, we also have uh, Digital Foundry's coverage on the entire situation, them sifting through the information, uh, also giving us more insight into things that Tom's reporting did not have so far, uh, which, first off, they do corroborate all the information, which uh, is nice in case you were doubting, but again, as we said, like the reason why all this happened now is because like most third parties finally got this info, and at a certain point, there's just no holding it back. Like This happened exactly with PS4 Pro at the time. Once third parties had all this info, that's how the leak got out there for PS4, uh, PS4K or PS4 Neo, if you remember the rumors from back then. But anyway, um, 
What we did find out from uh, Digital Foundry going over the uh, internal documents as well is that PS5 Pro has gained variable rate shading. So this is something that was available on Xbox Series X and uh, PS5 did not have it, but Pro is now going to get this. Uh, and also more importantly, based on developer disclosures, PSSR can be quote, backported to any existing PlayStation game, which is a very specific language. So uh, basically what Digital Foundry is explaining here, they're referencing how this is different compared to PS4 games where they can receive special improvements on PS5 through backwards compatibility if the game is running on the most up-to-date SDK. Uh, but this, in theory, suggests that you know older PS4 and PS5 games can get PSSR support uh, with a patch, but that doesn't have to be as big of a hurdle in requiring the most up-to-date SDK build uh, from the studio because that's the real big caveat, right? So to sort of break that down uh, with the, the example they gave, you know, there are some PS4 games that when played through backwards compatibility, uh, they did have to get patched, but it's something where they don't have to be native PS5 games. If they're running on the most recent up-to-date SDK, then that title could run at, say, 120 frames per second. We saw that with a few PlayStation 4 games, uh, and it's usually like live service stuff, so uh, one of the examples was Warzone before a native PS5 uh, version came up, if I remember correctly, and also uh, Apex Legends. So those are you know live service games. They always get content updates. They're running on the most recent SDK. Um, and that's like an example where it doesn't have to be a native PS5 game for a PS4 title when played through backwards compatibility to run at 120 frames per second. Otherwise, PS5 will generally boost the performance of all PS4 games, but it will boost it up to frame rate caps or uh, dynamic res. That's all it can do, right? So it's a very particular example. But the good news here is that, you know, the same thing can happen with PS5 or it seems PS4 titles for PSSR, but they don't have to be on the most recent SDK. And that's the big, you know, hurdle with uh, improving a lot of older titles, right? Oftentimes they have to be on the most recent SDK. That's going to be a lot more costly and resource intensive for a lot of titles. So that's why like very old PS4 games more often than not are not getting any sort of, um, you know, modern improvements on PlayStation 5 or, or patches. That's normally the caveat. So this is great news. This does suggest that, um, you know, if PSSR is a really great technique that has uh, amazing um, results, then we could see more studios. Uh, st they'll still have to patch games, mind you, but uh, this should be a lot more conducive and accessible for them to offer PSSR compared to something like the PS4 example that we just gave. Uh, anyway, we also are learning that with PS5 Pro, Sony is increasing the allowable memory developers can use. PS5 Pro does still have the same 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 with more bandwidth, mind you, uh, but it's going from 12.5 gigs for developers to 13.7 for the Pro. So somehow Sony is allowing allowing 1.2 gigabytes of system memory to be used for the studios. And it's unclear if they're somehow doing this similar to PS4 Pro where there's a new pool of memory on the board that's going to handle some of those background tasks. So they're offloading it that way. Uh, or if maybe they just found some efficiency uh, gains with managing the memory and the system UI and things like that. And maybe that's how they're allowing more uh, space, again, based on bandwidth too. We're not entirely sure. Um, I'm a, I mean, this is kind of good news, but I'm a little bit nervous just in the sense that we don't fall into the same I, I guess the, the same space that we always do with like going from PSP 3, 4 towards the end of the life cycle, which is the consoles get a little bit slower and more sluggish and jittery based on how system memory is managed from uh, not only subsequent firmware updates, but in the case of something like this, where um, they're allowing more of that memory for developers, which is not inherently a bad thing, but it's a matter of how you handle it, right? So like, uh, you know, 1.0 firmware consoles versus near the end of the life cycle where they're up to date, we can see like PS4, as an example, can feel very sluggish compared to when it came out initially. So um, I don't want PS5 to be in that same area. Like I would still like the UI to be snappy and responsive all the way through, um, even though this is generally good news for studios that can get more headroom with memory, even more so for PSSR, where that's only requiring 250 megs uh, and it's like 180 for uh, the PlayStation machine learning library and then 64 for the game or something like that. That's how the split turns out. But that's still enough headroom out of the new 1.2 available memory. So they should have like another gig to use basically if they are using PSSR. Um, so in theory, I mean, this is uh, also great news uh, for uh, studios getting more mileage out of PS5 Pro.
The other caveat to this, though, which was part of the conversation for Digital Foundry's conversation around PS5 Pro itself, uh, was the CPU being a, a very minimal improvement, which this then led to IGN and, you know, a few other places taking this uh, or running with this as a headline, uh, which is that, you know, very CPU bound games are probably not really going to see a massive improvement for PS5 Pro, uh, GTA 6 being a big example. As in, if the game ships at 30 FPS uh, on base PlayStation 5 hardware, that does not mean PS, uh, PS5 Pro is going to be able to push that game to 60 because presumably uh, the Rockstar titles will be hitting the CPU limits of um, you know base PS5 consoles. Since we're only seeing a 10% gain on PS5 Pro, that's not enough headroom to take a game from 30 to 60. Um, and Digital Foundry does bring up a really good point here, which is that despite PS4 and PS4 Pro being the same, uh, a, a very similar scenario in that, you know, they were both Jaguar CPUs. It was not some kind of dramatic change. It was still something where they were running the uh, CPU frequency a lot higher. That was about 30%, whereas this time around, it's only amounting to about 10%, even though it's, again, still a Zen 2 CPU, uh, which it was still capable enough at the time, but uh, because some studios are hitting the CPU uh, roof here, like the ceiling, those games are still probably going to be problematic. So what they're suggesting and reminding people of is that uh, for CPU bound games, if they are, let's say, maybe struggling to hit 30 or struggling to hit 60, then Pro might be able to, you know, have those games hit a, a safer or a more reliable frame rate. But you're probably not going to see a game go from 30 to 60. And again, GTA 6 being a prime example, which is a very good point. Uh, the one thing that, that they do bring up outside of compatibility, which we mentioned in the one discussion topic, but it is a matter of times being a lot different this time around. PS5 Pro not only has, uh, or rather PlayStation 5 in general has the, you know, the sort of reverse boost clocks that are well, tied to a power limit. There's a set power budget on the console, and that's where it's tied to the frequency. But there's also a matter of die shrinks, which, you know, we're still probably expecting 6 nanometer, whereas PS4 to PS4 Pro went from, what was that, 24 to 16 or something. So um, it's just, you know, there's really not... Well, we're, we're assuming Sony probably is not in a position to really run the, the, the clock speed any higher than, let's say, 10%. That's probably what they're really going to get out of this thing. So um, it, it's a valid point. I will say this is maybe the one area where I often differ with Digital Foundry, which is that, you know, for them, they, they can see this as very disappointing, which is certainly valid. But uh, we've still seen for the vast majority of PS5 games so far that you know, these games are running at 60 frames per second. So it depends on how many games are really CPU bound. I mean, we are surely going to see more and more of them as the cycle progresses and we're not doing cross-gen games anymore. So it's certainly a valid concern. Um, but it's just something worth considering that we are probably going to see uh, probably going to see a handful of titles that uh, even with a pro they are probably not going to hit 60. But you could still see uh, improvements on the GPU side of things, which can still relate to uh, reliable frame rates, higher frame rates, or with PSSR coming in and really cleaning these games up. Next up, we have some not great news for PlayStation VR 2 based on a recent report from Bloomberg's Takashi Mochizuki, where they mentioned that PSVR 2 has been, uh, while well, the production has been halted, Sony is stopping production for the time being uh, as they work through backlogs of unsold stock, and that sales have slowly progressed uh, since the launch of the headset February of last year. And that's really all the report says, uh, which, uh, mind you, it's something where some people do like to point out, oh, it's this writer for Bloomberg because they always publish bad stories about PlayStation. Oftentimes they can come off as wrong down the road or something. Um, but this is like, whether this story is right or wrong, it's very believable, obviously. This is maybe the one story where people are completely overlooking that other part of it, and they're just like, oh yeah, I believe that because that's probably happening. And I would agree. I fully expect that is probably what's going on right now because as we saw, the one time Sony talked about sales figures was when it was the most, you know, I guess advantageous to put that out there because it was a, a fairly good launch. It was better than PSVR 1, but we saw the sales pace was probably not going to keep up with PSVR 1. And so that's where we are right now where, you know, the, the headset is probably not selling all that well. Uh, and this is like always a very exhausting topic. You all know that I do advocate for VR. I think it's a really great uh, space in general, whatever headset you decide to pick up. I think the experiences are really fun, engaging and, and cool and really mind blowing oftentimes. Uh, and there's a lot of really cool software there. But 
we've seen that it's just a, not a it's not a very big market <laughs> even outside of PSVR 2 right um, and that's what I, I always dislike about the you know the comparisons between say the MetaQuest where that headset is cheaper it's standalone it's under every circumstance imaginable going to sell way more than PSVR 2 ever will so with PSVR 2 it's more a matter of maybe benchmarking it to PSVR 1 which is hard to do because Sony is not telling us anything about it uh, but you know I will say it's something where I'm just not convinced because this is where a lot of this has gone gone into for the conversation surrounding the story is that, well, it's, it's Sony's fault, right? Because they're not doing enough for releasing games on it. Big AAA PlayStation Studio experiences. Um, but, you know, for me, this is like it, it very much feels like another Vita is unfolding right before our eyes, which I'm always of the mind where it was not just Sony's fault for the Vita's failure. You know, they shipped a lot of first party software for Vita for the first two years nothing happened it was just it, the marketplace was not there for a dedicated portable at the time so i genuinely think it was not just sony's fault for why vita did not do all that well they could have pumped boatloads of money through all these first party teams at uh, ps vita and it was not going to change the fortunes of that platform in any meaningful way it probably would have went from 15 million lifetime to you know another 20 25 maybe 30 million like okay is that really what you is that what we really want for vita right and then we didn't get these amazing single player ps4 epics around the same time frame right so that's kind of where psvr2 is you're not going to put you know, Naughty Dog or Insomniac, even though they have VR experience, but you're not going to put them on VR. You're not going to put uh, Sucker Punch on VR. I mean, best case scenario, you're probably getting like, you know, another Astro Bot. Maybe Fire Sprite will do something again. Uh, but it's if Sony's going to invest in VR, I would have preferred them to just pick up VR specialist studios that are outside of their main wheelhouse of, or their main lineup of studios, rather, because it doesn't make sense to put them on VR stuff. Uh, but I would have done that. I would have, you know, gone that route or other or really just investing in other VR studios and um, doing PS Studio games from that point of view, right? Second party experience is kind of like a Firewall Ultra, although that game did not do well and First Contact closed, which is terrible. But the comparison I was trying to make with Vita is that it's simply a different marketplace, which is that it's very niche. It's simply not that big. I mean, even MetaQuest, despite it selling very well on paper, has the same problem, right? They're not moving that many headsets. Meta has lost a, a ton of money in the virtual reality landscape from these games underperforming or not doing all that well. And the kind of money they've put into VR, I mean, it's just, it, it, they're both in the same position, right? The market is not there. So regardless of if first party games are there or not, I think PSVR 2 is just a victim of being this $550 headset uh, and it's very niche and I mean I think what Sony can do is drop the price well, let's see what that PC support is going to look like uh, but also still do what they are doing which is they give it a lot of attention people don't seem to want to agree with this but it gets a lot of airtime uh, visibility on the PlayStation blog during live streams state of plays I mean you know that is what they should be doing for it they are but you know there's only so much you can do for an audience that just seemingly doesn't want to get into the space. I, I think it all around is just a, a very, you know, disappointing situation because I, I do like PSVR 2 a lot. Um, but let's see what happens down the road if they can really, you know, turn this around in a way where it does a little bit better than what it's doing right now. Let's see the price drop come in. I really think they <laughs> need to do this. Um, but also let's see what the PC support looks like as well. Moving on to video game sales data, where we have some charts coming in for Europe and also the United States. Uh, for most notably, that would be Helldivers 2 and Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which have been uh, very fascinating games to follow for their sales performance. So uh, first up for Europe, uh, this is being reported by GamesIndustry.biz, citing the GSD, where Helldivers 2 was the top seller for February. Compared to Spider-Man 2, it's only tracking 5% behind, although Spider-Man 2 was only on PlayStation 5, so that was Still very impressive for that game um, but pc accounted for 56 percent of sales across europe for hell divers 2 and allegedly we're hearing from analysts that the game is probably around 8 million copies sold so far which is incredible given that game was probably not expected to move that many copies um, final fantasy 7 rebirth being on the market for only a day in february was number three in the top 10 and for comparison's sake launch aligning day one sales it's 23 percent behind final fantasy 7 remake but four percent higher than Final Fantasy 16. So this is exactly what I was talking about with that Japan sales data where it very much was surprising that it somehow was not able to, you know, meet or exceed FF, uh, FF16. 
but let's wait and see how the game does uh, in the West, considering it's much more global now in terms of its appeal. Uh, so we're seeing something where that makes a lot more sense, right? Only 23% behind a game that uh, was in a very good position of late life cycle PS4 during COVID, like it was never going to beat that, but only being 23% behind and then a little bit over 16, like that makes a lot more sense. Um, but over in the US, we also have data from Matt Piscatella of Circana, and it's the same here where February's top 20 has Helldivers 2 at number 1 and Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth at number 2. For Helldivers 2, nearly 60% of the sales were on Steam. And uh, also, as a, a little aside here, but PlayStation Portal is no longer being tracked as hardware. Uh, that's been moved into a new sales segment for remote play devices. And that was a 14% contributor to the 21% increase in accessory spending in February. So uh, yeah, the Portal is doing a lot better now because it's really coming into stock much more frequently. Um, it does seem to sit for a bit uh, before it sells out, so that's good. Uh, PS Portal is now being a bit more widely available. Still not convinced it's like this massive seller, mind you, but um, it's finally keeping up with the uh, demand, which was surprising to Sony. But uh, as far as Helldivers 2 goes, um, obviously it's doing amazing. At this point, it's a live service game, so we can't keep up with like all the ongoings for that game. Now you'd be better off like following somebody else that's covering Helldivers 2 content, but um, at least with that game, we can see the you know the dividends being paid out here of Sony doing a, a day and date launch for that game on PS5 and PC, where it's uh, really edged out a little bit more on PC. It's nearly a 50-50 split, uh, but in most cases we're seeing it's doing better on PC, which I mean that's you know for PlayStation and the health of this game, that is uh, exactly where you want to be. So congrats to Arrowhead. Moving on to Sony Interactive Entertainment's acquisition of Bungie, where so far it's been going uh, seemingly not that good based on rumors, but also confirmed news items that popped up this past week. So uh, let's talk about what happened. Now, first, uh, this one primarily a rumor, so take it with a very small grain of salt, but uh, it does seem very believable, which is uh, the well-known Destiny YouTube channel, Aztec Cross, had this email sent to them, which they then published as a story before corroborating this. So again, rumor. Um, but it's from an alleged Sony employee where they state that internally Sony is unhappy with the Bungie acquisition right now and that they see it as a failed investment. Um, the Western and Eastern leadership at PlayStation are at odds with how to approach taking over the ship. They feel Bungie's leadership is gluttonous and not doing their jobs to nurture the organization and that even with another round of layoffs, that won't be enough for Sony to rightfully take over the board and gain full control of Bungie. And apparently Bungie has also not been doing well with advising Sony's teams and that Sony wants to turn Destiny into more of a profitable game and they want to revamp the game's monetization model and try to facilitate growth for the IP. Now, meanwhile, a day later, IGN ran a story revealing that there was a director shakeup at the studio where the marathon director, Christopher Barrett, was replaced by the former Valorant director, uh, Joe Ziegler, which after IGN contacted Bungie for comment, they instead just confirmed this directly on X that Ziegler has had the role for the last nine months. Uh, sources are also telling IGN that Bungie is putting more resources into Marathon now and that the direction has changed slightly under Ziegler's leadership. And we're also hearing that within the company, there's an expectation that the senior the senior leadership will leave in summer 2026 when the final retention bonuses are paid out from Sony's acquisition. Now that final part was probably going to happen anyway because this is very common for acquisitions across many companies and sectors it doesn't matter what kind of field we're talking about like usually when the retention bonuses are used up like the ceo founder any sort of other leaders like they all leave ship and and so that that's very common it was probably going to happen even if bungie was in a very good healthy position but uh one thing does seem abundantly clear based off well the layoffs that did happen the rumors of more layoffs the apparent bad pre-orders for the final shape uh, the other corroborated stories from former employees complaining about the senior leadership. Uh, also, the price that we know Sony paid for the company. It seems like Sony, one, didn't do their due diligence. Um, they overpaid. They probably are frustrated to a degree. Uh, and it's it's really fascinating to watch this play out between the two communities that, you know, prior didn't really have the kind of crossover for, like, dedicated fan bases. What I mean is, like, you look at the Bungie side of things, right? People that play a lot of Destiny and follow Bungie news and what's going on with the, with the studio. And, you know, for them, the sentiment, which I'm surprised by, but a lot of those people do seem to be in the, the 
they seem to be in agreement that like maybe a Sony takeover would not be a bad thing because hey, look at how Sony manages all their other studios and you know we've had so many complaints about Bungie's leadership for a long time and how former employees have such a bad time at the studio and so it's like the sentiment there actually does seem to be maybe this is what Bungie needs. But on the PlayStation side of things, for you know dedicated PlayStation fans, it's a matter of like, they overpaid, why did you do this? Uh, if this was a waste of money and you could have put this into more single player experiences or you know this, that, and the other, which um, Bungie still very much made sense on paper, which is you know Sony, if they're gonna do a lot of live service games, it's always gonna be a conflict of interest to try and approach some other like publisher as a, you know, I mean, they're competitors obviously, but it's a matter of like, you can't approach the Valorant team or the Apex team and be like, hey, can you help us figure out how we're going to eventually poach your player base <laughs> for a live service game? Like there's always that conflict of interest. For Sony, even if it did seem like like a lot of money at the time, it's, it would appear as though the value was there if Bungie could integrate into you know, PlayStation Studios or rather advise those studios on how to best approach live service. And even though they might have looked at, say, you know, Twisted Metal or uh, the, the Last of Us and had problems with it, and their advice was, you know, you either have to put a lot more money into this thing to fix the long-term economy of the game, or it's better off canceling it. I mean, even that might have been like, you know, worth it to Sony in their eyes to cancel those games and take the the tax break, even though it was a lot of money that they, that they lost. Um, so, I mean, there's like a lot of angles in which one could look at this, but it seems like we might very much be on a path of Sony taking over the board, uh, which in that case, it's like you've got Sony taking over a company that they acquired for expertise and it, now they're going to be leading it when they don't have that expertise. So, I don't know, this could go south, more south than it already is, but um, again, sentiment seems to be from the Bungie side of things that this could be good news. Uh, if that is going to happen, remains to be seen, but we'll keep following this closely and see what plays out. Moving on to our next news story, the legendary former producer for PlayStation of 30 years, Connie Booth, uh, now has a new role at EA, where um, she's accepted the role of Group General Manager Action RPG at EA. Uh, EA's entertainment head, Laura Mille, confirmed the news to IGN, saying that Booth will manage EA Motive, Cliffhanger, and Bioware, with Laura Mille saying, and I quote here, Connie spent more than 30 years helping to build Sony Interactive Entertainment's internal studios and is responsible for guiding the development of some of their biggest franchises, including Marvel Spider-Man 1 and 2, The Last of Us, Ghost of Tsushima, Uncharted, Ratchet & Clank, to name just a few. So if you remember at the time when we discussed her departure, how it was a, a very big deal because while she may not have been this public-facing entity at PlayStation, she's got a 30-year history at the company. Her name is in the credits of most major PlayStation releases. She was very good at her job managing all those projects and just, uh, you know, really facilitating a healthy pipeline for all those games. And uh, then when she left, um, David Jaffe being a close friend of hers, um, you know, he was the one that put that out there. And initially it seemed like she either probably got, like it wasn't a amicable departure. So maybe she was sort of forced out of the company because we have really no indicator that it was amicable, right? So no sort of anecdotes or news on Twitter popping up from former employees or anything like that. It was just kind of very sneaky little um, Sony spokesperson saying that she's left the company and like, oh, she was valuable or whatever. Kind of like Sean Layden, right? So uh, at the time we said that wherever Connie does go, she will be a valuable asset to that company. And now we see that as EA. So uh, great news for EA. And uh, I'm glad at least that she did uh, get back on her feet relatively soon and what should be a, a vital role for EA and managing those studios it is something where Connie will be sorely missed. Next up, Media Molecule has outlined what they're planning on doing for content curation long-term on Dreams, where they're planning on closing support for the game, obviously, uh, but they'll still keep the game live. You can still publish new levels and things like that, but uh, they did confirm on their blog that they're saying goodbye to the uh, last of the content curation team uh, in mid-April, so they're trying to go to a more automatic process by updating the game uh, one last time to offer more playlists and refine the recommendation system to where it's filtered in uh, not only new creations but existing ones as well so they're trying to you know give the game a bit of autonomy and not have to lean on manual uh, manual human reviews for the existing content that's going to be rotating throughout the the dreams universe the dreamscape if you will um, so that's kind of where that game is going to sit when it's uh fine when it finally sunsets which um 
is really all you can ask for when a studio is going to move on from what was a title that was basically live service, seeing all these new updates uh, over time. Still a really frustrating thing how all of Dreams really played out with uh, Media Molecule and not, well, being able to find a big audience, but also seemingly not being allowed to really take this thing to the next level by letting people publish content offside or outside of Dreams, excuse me. So uh, it's something we've talked about before, so not going to spend too much time complaining about it again, but uh, at least we have this sort of, you know, end of life update for Dreams and it's going to be supported for years to come. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway, where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or X. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it is so simple. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the news stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all. And uh, we were very busy this past week. So on Monday, we had a breaking news story for PS5 Pro specs leaking out. The CPU, the memory, things like that. So that's why we uh, talked about that right away. And then on Wednesday, I wanted to check out that LBP Hub archive that showed up. So uh, always fun when we can <laughs> explore something a little bit more niche uh, for like an older build that pops up online. And then uh, yesterday, we looked at the PS5 Explore tab uh, update that popped up. So that seemed uh, worth discussing right away, considering it's uh, really cool and much better than what was there previously. But uh, that is pretty much it. So we should go back to uh, just one upload next week, unless there is more breaking news items that pop up. We'll always do that uh, outside of LTPS if it's a, a big item. But uh, otherwise, that is it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.